Can I have my water, please, Tawsey boy? <laughs> Thank you very much. So I want to recap quickly, just from last week. Genesis 2, verse 7, we'll read together. It says, The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath, the breath of life. And the man became a living being. All right, so you know that Genesis 2, verse 7 cuts across the Big Bang and man coming from tadpoles or mud. It says, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put a man he had formed. The Lord God made kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2.15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat it, you will certainly die. All right. God didn't say, I will kill you. He said, you will die. Big difference. He didn't say, I'm going to punish you. He said, you're going to punish yourself. And it's the same even today. So you know that man, human beings are made up, it says he Man out of the dust of the ground. I think it's a channel problem, guys. So let's do this. I will go here. Can you give us 30 seconds? And we need to find... Mm, what is this channel? It's A2. Is it on A2 there? Let's go to A... Let's go to B2. B2, no. B2. All right, I'm B2 here. Should have made a D2. R2, D2. See what I mean? You can do anything. So it says he made him out of the dust of the ground and then he breathed breath into him. The breath of God. The breath of God. God breathed life into Adam. What did he put inside of him? When he, when he made him out of the ground, when he made him out of dust, he was just a fleshly body with a mind, but dormant. And as he breathed his spirit into Adam, Adam became a living being. He became a living being. So human beings... Our body, soul, and spirit, we are three in one. We are body, soul, our intellect, and our thoughts, our body, flesh, physiological makeup, and our spirits. And when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they corrupted their spirits. And their spirits were no longer in harmony with God anymore. Their, 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 their identity as sons and daughters of God got shattered as they ate of that poison. Amen. So when God said you would die, he didn't mean you would die. That's why Satan comes and says, uh, did he really say that? You know you're not going to die. He knows you're going to be clever like him. That's why he doesn't, want to eat from, he doesn't want you to eat from this tree, as I said last week. And again, why did God put the, God, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden? Because he's not a controlling God. He didn't hide it away. Amen? Love that's force is not love at all. It's just control. Amen. Amen? You will love me or you will die. No, that's a murderous husband or murderous wife. So God takes the tree and he puts it right in the middle next to the other one. and says, don't eat it. You have a choice to make. Choose wisely. Amen? 
And we understand that the Bible says the serpent was craftier than all the other animals. And certain serpent came to Eve and said, you won't surely die. And he confuses and he, he messes up God's word. And she says, oh, and she goes, yeah. He says, you, at the end of the day, he doesn't want you to eat from this tree because you're going to be like him, knowing good from evil. So he immediately throws some doubt and some shade at God and says, look, he's not as good as he proposes to be. Because if he was that good, he'd let you eat from any tree. But he's trying to withhold good stuff from you. So he's not a God to be trusted. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Don't trust his word. But you can trust mine. I'm telling you the truth, Eve. What does Eve do? She believes the enemy. She believes the sa Satan. And she eats from this tree. And she corrupts her spirit. The spirit of mankind has been corrupted ever since. And next week I'm going to talk on the sacrifice. So I want you to make it. Next week's going to be a good one. Amen. I can tell you now, it's going to be a very good one. We're just going up on these ones. Now, how God makes that thing right again. But what man tries to do by continually eating from this tree within himself. Amen? So we understand the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the mind of the unbeliever. Why? Because Satan is the author of confusion. And what he does, he comes and he uses his pseudo power and he, he, he blinds the mind of the unbeliever. So the unbeliever cannot see the truth of who God really is. Amen. And use all kinds of things to do what? To undermine his goodness. Because if I can get you to believe that God's not a good God, then why would you want to go there? First, I want to try to get you to believe that he doesn't exist. If I can't get that right, I'm going to get you to believe that he's actually not good at all. All he wants to do is punish you and hurt you because of who you are. And we know that's the very antithesis of the gospel because the Bible says in John 3.16 that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. To do what? To restore the world back to himself. Amen? Amen. That's the antithesis of the gospel. The gospel is God loves you. Amen. Remember the old creed song with arms wide open. And he's just standing waiting. Come home. Amen. Amen. But Satan says, no, don't worry about that. This is the only tree you need. You just need the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? Because he blinds the mind of the unbeliever. And as I said last week, just to finish this intro and this recap, it says that Eve looked at the tree. She looked at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and she saw that it was pleasing. Is it up there? Oh, there we go. I took it out of my notes. Let's read. And the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for wisdom. She took some and she ate it. She also then, she gave, they also gave some to her husband, as I said last week, the doffy, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both them were opened. Opened? Were their eyes opened? Mm. The eyes were opened to the wrong thing and then blinded to the right thing. The eyes were opened to the fact that they were naked. That's why God comes down and says, who said you were naked? And they immediately, what did they do? Let's grab some fig leaves and cover ourselves up. Hey God, we, made a mistake. we don't know what we've done yet. We're naked. How do we sort this problem out? I don't do that. They go, whoo, we're naked. And they use humanistic, secular reasoning to fix the problem without referencing the Holy Spirit. That's the corruption of man. Amen? And then we know God comes and changes the situation, actually gives them Gucci. So the same problem for human beings, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's what John tells us. The love of this world. It's the lust of the eyes. What my eyes see. The lust of the flesh. What my, what my physiological body needs and craves. That word crave. That word in the, in the book of John. 1 John. That word lust is the word crave. What my body craves. I crave. Covet. I'm, mm, I want that thing. In my flesh. My eyes see it. Ooh. And then immediately my mind starts to reason how good this is going to be for me. It's going to do this and this and this and this and this and it's going to make me all these things. And I start to want after that thing. Amen? Amen. 
The very same three things. So we understand that when they ate of this, they ate of what's called the seed. So out of this, out of this tree, in Galatians 5, 22, or Galatians, Galatians 5, the end of uh, chapter 5, it says, Do not be fooled. God cannot be mocked. Essentially, that word mocked is the same word basically fooled. So don't you fool yourself, Craig. You can't fool me, God says. Or Paul says, don't fool yourself, Craig. You can't fool him. A man reaps what he sows, i.e., this tree will always produce the fruit after its own kind, just like every other animal and species on this planet. Amen? Cats didn't come from mud along with dogs. Cats came from cats. Just as science will tell you today. Oh, look, we took two dogs, Alsatians. Now we've got a, a lynx. <laughs> In the zoo, we bred two hippos and we made ourselves an African elephant. No, that's not science. That doesn't work that way. Anyhow, the seed germinates the seed after its own kind. Likewise, this side. The seed, what you eat, what you reap, you sow. What you sow, you reap. Amen? What you sow, you reap. Whatever you sow down the line, you're going to reap down the line. That's why I've said we counseled many, many people. And the guys are struggling with this and struggling with that and struggling with this. I say, no, you're eating bananas now. You want to start eating apples. So stop sowing bananas. Because as long as you're sowing bananas, you're going to continue to eat from those bananas. Amen? Amen? You, have to start, you have to stop sowing the thing that's caused the problem for you in the past. And that's, that's the part where you need the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to jump ahead of myself now. So the seed of Cain, carnal man, versus the seed of Abel, or Christ, or the spiritual man. The seed of Cain versus the seed of Abel. Why the seed of Cain? Because you understand what happens with Cain. And I'll speak a bit about that next week, about the sacrifice. But Cain, if you understand, who's heard of Cain and Abel? Most of you. Cain tries to do something. And what happens? It gets rejected, as I'll speak about next week. And I won't say that again. And Abel gets accepted. And in Cain's heart, murder rises up. Why? From fear and insecurity. Fear and insecurity rise up as, he gets, as his sacrifice gets rejected. And, and Abel gets accepted. And he comes and he, the Bible says he murders his brother. And he kills him. Because of the brother and what the brother does inside his own heart. The jealousy, rage, and anger, the insecurity that comes up of being rejected. Amen? And so, why? Because he's eating from the same tree. The same tree, that's why it says, the serpent who, was, who slithers on the dust of the ground, essentially he, he, he keeps low to the ground. He's carnal in nature, earthly, unspiritual in nature. Everything coming from this tree is carnal, earthly, and unspiritual in nature. It's not authored by the Holy Spirit. It's authored by humanistic, secular reasoning. And the first point of call is the devil. And he tempts us to eat from this tree. And anyone eating from this tree stays close to the ground, carnal, earthly, unspiritual. Amen. So Cain, you understand, is what? A tiller of the soil. And Abel tends the flocks. But he is the tiller of the soil. He works the soil. He works the ground, the earth. By the sweat of his brow, after the curse, after, the, after Adam and Eve ate of that, of that, of that whatever it was, Everything became cursed. It was poisonous. It infiltrated the entire creation, including the stars and the heavens. Everything God made. And I forgot my train of thought. <laughs> it's dawn because you're just staring at me. She's like, oh God, I love that guy. <laughs> 
just want to take him home and anyhow get him to wash the dishes that's what I'm going to say so we understand Cain, the seed of Cain tiller of the soil that's all he knows is the earthly the low place the seed of Cain all the way down, and we understand the seed of Christ, and all the way down, and what God proposes to do with that seed. So, page wherever I was, page 15. Let's read you quickly. After the transgression, this is a book called There Were Two Trees in the Garden by Garfield. Rick Joyner, I love this book. Listen to this. After the transgression of Adam and Eve, the Lord prophesied the propagation of the two seeds within man. Those who would embrace the nature of the serpent and those who would be the nature of Christ. Cain and Abel clearly reflect these seeds and their predicted enmity. Cain is in all of us. He was the firstborn in the type of the first man, Adam. He was of the earth, a tiller of the ground. This designates a fundamental characteristic of those who we will refer to as the seed of Cain, i.e. the earthly minded. This includes all who have not truly been born again by the Spirit, as the Lord has testified. And John 3, 3, let's just read John 3, that's up there now, says, Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Say, no one. And when the Bible says no one, it surely means no one. How can someone be born again when they are old? Nicodemus said, because Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you. Now you know when Jesus says, very Jesus, I tell you. Listen to me, Nicodemus. He says, Very truly, I tell you. So he hammers that point home. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Verse 6. Flesh gives birth to flesh. But spirit gives birth to the spirit. What is of the flesh gives birth to the flesh. You want to stop eating bananas, stop sowing them. Don't fool yourself. You can't keep doing the same thing and expect different results. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Amen? But spirit gives birth to spirit. So eventually you have to jump tracks and go, I've got to change the way I'm thinking and change what I'm doing. Amen? Just as the curse came upon the serpent to crawl in his bed, he forces him to conform to the contour of the earth. So his seed is confined to the natural realm. And 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit. A person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them, considers them, now, come on, we can do better than that. Considers them? Why? Because it just sounds doff. There's no God who in light be and made creation. That's rubbish. It came from, it came as a big bang. Yes, but you do realize that big bang theory completely negates your very own first law of thermodynamics, which means nothing is created or destroyed. So the big bang broke that law. Are you happy with that? Well, it had to have broken that law in order for it to have happened because there is no God. And if there is no God, something must have had what we see here. So you must have broken the law. Amen. Foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. They are discerned only through the Spirit. So the natural man or the man thinking naturally cannot understand the things of God because they are discerned only through the Spirit. It's only through revelation by the Holy Spirit, that you can begin to discern the things of the Spirit. Otherwise, they just seem foolishness to you. And you reject them with contempt. This is our condition until the curse is removed in Jesus. 
I'll talk about the sacrifice next week. This is our condition till the curse is removed in Christ. A man must be born again. When I'm unsaved and I don't know Jesus, I am forced to eat from this tree forever. Only in Christ do I have the ability to eat from this tree. Outside of Christ, I'm confined. Paul tells me I'm a slave to unrighteousness. Now, don't think I'm slave to bad behavior. No, no. Unrighteousness. Not unrighteous behavior. Unrighteousness. I'm a slave to it because I can only eat from that tree. Remember, it's not God's fault. Well, there was all the evil in the world. God's not so good. If there's so, it was all the evil. He wouldn't be so, he's, you know, he's bad because there's all the evil in the world. No, God didn't cause Adam and Eve to eat from this tree. He gave them a choice, just like he gives every single person on this planet a choice. And their choice, either you can choose that or choose that. Your choice. Amen. And the more I reject him and the more I embrace this, the more earthly, unspiritual, and carnal I become. And what happens? Evil just floods in. Satan is the author of evil. Amen. So he loves it when we murder each other. He loves it when we kill each other, stab each other to death. He loves it when the violent kill the violent. He loves it. And more, more, kill, maim, destroy, kidnap, bury alive, do whatever you need to do. Kill each other. I love it. Amen. He's not going to change his ways because you think you're a nice person. So Jacob and Esau, who's heard that story? Seven of you. Malachi 1 verse 2 says, Yet I have loved... Let me just see something quickly here. Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. Now, the word hated in the Hebrew is not hated as in I hate you. It means Esau I have rejected. Esau I have rejected or I have shunned. And have turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Ooh, that sounds rough, God. Why would you do that to the poor dude? Shall we read on? Genesis 25, verse 27. And the boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents with his mommy and daddy. <laughs> so Esau was a man's man, a hunter, a gatherer. He went out and got the food, and he did the good things that a family, a boy of those days would do. Who'd be the, the apple of any dad's eye. Amen? Rough and tough and man of the country. Jacob liked to stay at home and clean the tents and do the washing. So it just seemed like strange. Like, well, what's better? Well, we need we need both, but essentially. Any father would love this guy. Amen? He's, uh, this, I'm proud of my, the, my other son. I don't quite know what's happened to him. I don't know what's going down there. To watch him carefully. Amen? Isaac. I, I said Jacob. I mean Isaac. Isaac, the father who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau. But Rebecca, the mom, loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, so Jacob, being the homebody, was cooking a nice pot of stew. <laughs> Little poiki. <laughs> and you do understand that when they came out of the womb, Esau came first, Jacob came second, but Jacob came out clutching Esau's ankle. You read it. Two twins. They were twins. Esau came out first. 
But Jacob came out holding his ankle, trying to pull him down. Matter of fact, the, the name, that name, Jacob, meant supplanter or one who tries to take over. Basically, one who tries to d- d- take over by deception. And you see from birth already, he's trying to grab his brother's ankle to pull him down. So you understand, you think that God would love an Esau, but would kind of be a bit, you know, Jacob's all about himself. And about getting ahead. But God says, Esau, Jacob I love, but Esau I didn't love. Or I shunned, rather. Not didn't love, I shunned. So once when his cooking stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. Say famished. Okay. And that means, that word, the Hebrew word means hungry, but also tired, weary, forlorn, kind of broken down. Just he comes in, finished, up, walks into the house. He said to Jacob, quick, say quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was called Edom. And Edom, the Hebrew there, that word Edom, means one who comes from the Dead Sea. One who comes from the Red Sea or the Dead Sea. See, nothing grows there. Jacob replied, first... Sell me your birthright. Give me your inheritance. Sell it to me. Give it to me. Verse 32. Look, I'm about to die. So we know that's not true. But Esau says to Jacob, look, I'm hungry. I'm starving. I'm weary. I'm finished. I'm about to die. Hurry, give me some stew. He says, first give me your inheritance. Sell it to me. Esau said, what good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Why? Because Esau sold his entire inheritance. Everything that God had given him, sold it for what? For a pot of stew. He walked in, he saw the stew. The stew seemed, mm, it's going to do, do me good. I'm about to die. I'm, full, I'm finished. I need it to strengthen me. And what he did was, he sold everything. His his spiritual inheritance. We understand now this is a, not a spiritual connotation. We understand it's a practical connotation. But we know that the Old Testament is really mirrors and, and uh, um, metaphoric things for how we see the spiritual realm in the New Testament. Amen? And so what Esau did, is he said, no, I'm not worried about that. I'm just going to eat this to satisfy a quick craving right now. And I will sell my entire birth. What good is it to me? You can have it. Just give me the stew. So what happens see, when, we, when we slither, when we slither, when we're on the ground and we earthly, we're unspiritual, we will sell our inheritance, our kingdom inheritance that God, God has called us in our marriages and our, with our parenting, with, our, with, our, with everything we do, we'll sell it quickly to do what? To gratify a quick fleshly, earthly thing. And then go, what good is that to me in the moment? What value is that to me in the moment? All I can see is the stew, and this is all I want. And the Bible says that God, that that mindset, God rejects that mindset. He doesn't reject you. He rejects that thinking. He rejects that way of thinking. What about Jacob? Jacob did everything he could in order to get the birthright. It says he wrestled with God. Esau didn't wrestle with anyone. He just tossed it aside and said, give me the red lentil stew. The Bible says Jacob spent the whole night wrestling with this angel. Wrestling, came out with a He wrestled. It's good when we grab hold of God and say, teach me your ways. Show me who you are. I want to know you. See, God loves that heart. He loves that mindset. Listen, we're all a bit faulty at times, grabbing our brother's ankles. 
But God loved Jacob. Why? Because of his mindset and his heart. His heart was for the purposes of the kingdom. His heart was to eat from this tree continuously, even though he was a bit of a funny character. And then God, she changed his name to Israel. Amen. But Esau, God rejected. Why? Because he maintained this. He wasn't interested in his spiritual inheritance. And he was willing to give it up for a quick thing. Amen? I live with my girlfriend. What's wrong with that, Craig? Well, all you're doing sir, is you are giving up your spiritual inheritance for a quick thing. For a quick thing. Amen? But I love her. No, if you loved her, you would honor her as the bride of Christ. You wouldn't put her in, in such a temptating place, a tempting place. Satan comes to tempt. God does not tempt us. Well, we save money. Yeah, exactly. The whole point is your pot of stew. You're trying to save. It's all about money. See, I'm about to die. Quickly give it. To, I'm afraid. I'm ba- in a bad shape. Quickly do it. Fix me now. And Jacob goes, yeah, you can have that. I know what's coming for me. See, we need to say to the devil, whatever temptation he's trying to tempt me with, I'm not going to go down that road. You can keep that. I know what God is calling me to. It might take a little bit longer, but I'll get there eventually. The Holy Spirit will open up doors for me. Why? Because I trust him. Amen. I trust God to open up, my, open up the door for my future. And far be it from me to put you in a position to eat from the same tree. See, Eve gave Adam the apple. And it says, Adam took it and ate some of it. So when your girlfriend says, let's move in together, you say, no, babe, I love you with the love of Jesus. I honor you. I will not put you in that position because I love you. Let's, I'll tell you what. We'll stay together. Let's keep worshiping the king together. And God will give us the finances to get married. Yes. Amen. We've had people come to Craig and Dawn and I. Hey, how much would charge to do a, a, a wedding? Mm, nothing. We'll do it in the house, and we'll supply the tea and coffee and biscuits and cake. And we've had three weddings now in our home. Amen? Ultimately, it's not about the size of the wedding. I know people, believers that are living together, Christian people, they're living together, a husband and wife, and they're saying they want to get married when they have enough money. It's like, well, what are you doing? You put the cart before the horse there, sunshine. You're already acting like you're married. What's the big, just go down to the thing and sign the piece of paper. I don't know, but my wife, my, and they always call each other husband and wife when they're not. They, 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 they want this big wedding. You're living in fairyland. So you have this beautiful wedding, and then, okay, let's go home. Back to our flat where we were last night. And do what we did last night. It's, it's, you've already gone back. Amen. No, I don't want to sell my inheritance for a pot of stew, for something that's fleshly and earthly. I want to grab hold of the tree of life. I want the Holy Spirit to speak to me and guide me and lead me. I had a conversation with someone a little while ago that I spoke about his son. He's 15 or 16 years old. And, um, and we're speaking about role models. And I said to him, what, what, what is a good role model? And he said to me, ah, he thought about it for a while. He's in his 40s, I guess. And he said, hey, someone who, you know, does well, life, this and that and, and all these, you know. All he's doing is talking about a good role model eating from the street. As long as I look good on the outside and I've got all my stuff together and I'm making some money and my, and my, son, my children can see, hey, what a great role model to follow in his footsteps so that I can be successful like him one day. No. Without Holy Spirit, it's a big failure. Yes. A good role model. So as we were talking, I didn't say no to him. I just said, well, a good role model would be someone who knows how to eat from this tree. From the tree of life. He knows how to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And he's able to teach his children as they get older to hear God. I want the Holy Spirit to lead me, show me where I must go. What I must do, who I must be with, where I must live, what church I need to be involved in. Holy Spirit, you speak to me. Amen. Amen. Yes. That's a good role model. 
Someone who has the ability to hear God's voice. And you can look behind them. And I said to this gentleman, and not two years, three years, give 10 years of good fruit behind them. A decade of good fruit. Look behind their lives. One, 10 years. Let's see 10 years of good fruit behind them. Hey, I'm going to incline my ear to this person. Teach me what you know. Amen. Amen. In Hebrews 13, it says, uh, um, Consider your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. They, remember your leaders. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. A good role model has a great outcome in their way of life. And someone whose faith you can imitate. Amen. 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 I did a loafing, a, a loafing, no, no loafing. I did a life coaching course about two years ago. I've been a pastor for many years now. Dawn now in this church and the previous church. And as a matter of fact, it was a Christian friend of mine, an American guy who is part of, but well, it doesn't matter. And, uh, um, and he runs a coaching school. And I did a course through them, through him, with four other people. And a lot of the stuff that gets learned in there, that I learn in there, it, it doesn't have a huge spiritual weight behind it. A lot of it you could sit with someone and just, and just teach them about life and why they're doing specific things about life and help them become successful as the world sees success. Amen. Without the unction of the Holy Spirit and teaching someone how to hear the Holy Spirit, all that stuff, is, it doesn't count. Matter of fact, Paul, the apostle, says we have, been, we have been released and freed from the empty way of life handed down to us by our forefathers. Amen? In other words, all they've ever done. Remember like that movie uh, um, with uh, Bugger Lugs? Will Smith. Legend. I'm legend. And they go, he goes into that room with his gun, his AR-15 rifle and his sight. And he goes into, into this dog. And, and, and all the, those guys are standing around in a circle. They just like, looks like they're eating something. That's what it seems like. People just, just standing around the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's all they eat from continuously. Is that it? Is that, are we done with the microphone? So quickly, natural man. Quick point number one. The natural man does, the natural man, okay, if I, if I copy and paste that, it's not going to be no good. Does consults. How's that sound? The natural man consults, forget about the word does. The natural man consults with his own reasoning or understanding and bypasses God when doing what he believes. Lives by sight. The spiritual man. Thank you. All right. The spiritual man does not consult with his own reasoning or understanding when it comes to God doing the impossible. This is faith. The natural man consults his own reasoning and his own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Amen? In all your ways, acknowledge Him, the tree of life, and He will direct your paths. And I'm not talking about acknowledge Him. Okay, I just threw a prayer up. Yeah, I'm doing this and I prayed about it. No. That's not acknowledging Jesus. Amen? Remember, Jesus is the head of His body. You can't really do something with the head without the rest of the body knowing. Unless you've got Parkinson's disease. Then your hands do whatever they want to do. Amen. Many believers got Parkinson's disease. They're doing all kinds of stuff, trying to bypass the body, and the head's going, mm. Amen. You cannot do, you cannot negotiate or chat with the head without the body really knowing about it. We're all one body. Amen. Number two, the natural man is blind to the greater reality beyond this natural or physical world. What did Esau say? He despised the reality. He desp- it says he despised it. Just give him my stew. Natural man. Despise it. The seed of Cain. The spiritual man realizes the greater reality beyond this natural and physical world. There's something else that's happening. We are body, soul, and spirit. There's something else happening on the planet. I'll tell you, I, I'm, it, the more as... Um, as we get closer and closer to the end of the age, you see 
the movies coming out, a lot of them are more and more and more supernatural. So we, human beings, we have a bent towards the supernatural. We're an armored of supernatural beings. Amen? And often you'll find in, 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 uh, um, in, in hero movies, supernatural hero movies, the Spider-Mans, the Supermans, and all those other guys, it's always the light that prevails over the darkness. It's the darkness that wants to kill the whole planet, and it's the light that sacrificed himself for the planet. All it is is a mirror image of Satan and how he operates and Jesus and how he operates. Because we have a bent inside of us. Amen. We are created in the image of God. Every person that's been shattered by Adam and Eve eating from that tree. And only through Jesus can it be made whole again. Amen. Number three, the natural man is confused with regards to his identity and is always searching for meaning and purpose for his life in this world. The natural man. See, around Satan is the author of confusion. I've shattered the identity. Don't let them see who they truly can be in Jesus. And let them stay confused about their purpose and what they're supposed to be doing on this planet. Let's just make it all about them. All about them. This is all about them. There's nothing else. There's no spiritual, there's no other things happening. It's just them and their world come from tadpoles. And this planet's going to whatever in a handbag, so we need to get to Mars. Amen? Let's go colonize Mars, because things, as you look, hey, something's happening with this world. Human beings are self-destructive. I used to think that back in my day. Back in my day when I used to do drugs and carry on, I used to think human beings are self-destructive. It's like we just self-destruct. We're just on a path to try and kill ourselves all the time. Amen? Because everything you do around this tree brings death. No matter how much you try and strategize with another thousand people on how to fix things, you're just going to bring death. Amen? Our wonderful government. Remember the ABC? AIDS, the AIDS epidemic in South Africa. ABC, abstain or be faithful, condemn So abstain is the best thing. Just don't do it. A. B. Okay, well, if you can't, then just be faithful with one person. Okay, well, if you can't, then wear a condom. A, B, C. Remember that? No, sir. You can't fix the outward. You've got to fix the heart. You've got to fix the inside. You can't conform from the outside. It doesn't work. So it never that campaign went for a little while. And, okay, let's try something else now. And then something else. And something else. And something else. You've got to fix the inside. Number wherever. Number four. Number something. Three, the spiritual man actively lives out his allegiance to his true identity as a child of God, as a traveler through this world, and as a citizen of heaven. Jacob understood there's something else happening. I need that birthright. I'm willing to give up something for that birthright. I'm willing to wrestle with God to get my birthright. I need this birthright. I see value in eternal things. Amen. So we have prayer meetings and life groups. So sometimes we want to we want to we want to keep massaging those things in. Why? So that you will see a value in what these are because they add to your eternal destiny. And I said this many times before. I'll say it again quickly today. If I gave you three rand, and I said I'm going to give you three rand, meet me outside Spur at two o'clock tomorrow morning. I'll give you five bucks. Would you be there? No, no one. Why? Uh, uh, five rand. I'm going to give you 500,000 rand if you meet me outside Spur at 3 o'clock tomorrow morning. And I'll, here's the check right here. It's a cash check. I will give it to you. Just meet me outside Spur at 3 o'clock in the morning. Can I tell you what you'd do? You would not sleep. You would stay awake. You would go to Spur now and, stay, and camp outside. Why? Because there's massive value in 500,000 rand. Not much in five. See, we give ourselves what we value. We will do things, strange things. We will not sleep because we see such value in it. Amen. Some guys wake up early in the morning to go fishing. They spend the whole day for their fish, 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 but they can't spend time with the Lord and his people praying. So I don't see value in that. I despise my birthright. Just give me the pot of stew. Give me something that makes me happy now in the moment. I don't like my marriage. I don't like my kids. So I don't want to get away from everyone. Just give me something quickly. Arr. Amen. And the last one, this we finish. The natural man operates by fear of lack and insecurity. Fear of lack, fear of not having. Because God knows if you eat from this tree, you're going to get wise like him. Ooh, I, I, I want to be wise. I don't have. 
I'm not happy. I want fear. I'm not secure in who I am. I need it to make myself better. So I'll start eating this thing. The spiritual man operates by grace through faith. Amen? He has no need to rush things because he knows God will open the door for him at the right time, in the right moment, in the right place. So I want to end with this. Two things. I had a I had a company, I had two companies, 93, 94, and then from 2000 to 2008. 93, 94, this is all I did. I ate from this tree, me and my late cousin, Den Glen Construction. His name was Dennis Mack, my name is Craig Glen. Den Glen Construction. We built some single flats and houses and stuff and this, whatever. And it just never worked, and I always just, I was just, oh, always angry and not enough money and then blah, 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 blah. And then I came to Jesus, and I started eating from this tree. I went into business with two other guys, and God blessed us and blessed us and blessed us. Amen. But I didn't just, just, just do things because I wanted to do them. I was waiting for the Holy Spirit to speak to me through other people. My leaders, people that I respected and honored. Amen. Amen. And I forgot the second story. Next week, the sacrifice. I want to encourage you to make next week. It's going to be a great time. Amen. And I'm going to speak about the sacrifice of Cain and the sacrifice of Abel and how that plays out in today's world and what it does for you and I and how we get to eat from this tree and live the life that God's called us to live. Amen. Why don't we stand together? Jesus said, a man cannot enter king, the kingdom of heaven unless he's born again. You cannot, or we cannot eat from this tree unless we are saved by the blood of Jesus. Amen. So I want to just throw it out there this, this morning. In fact, Hebrews 9.27 says a man is appointed once to die and after that the judgment. We are stuck. If we die eating from this tree without being born again, we are stuck in that place. Our heavenly eternal address is not heaven, but some other place that the Bible tells us about. Amen? And uh, all I know is it's not a nice place. Whatever it is. Luke 16, the rich man Lazarus was standing there and the rich man dies and goes to hell. And it says, in, in, in flames, in torment, he spoke to Abraham. Now we understand that when you're burning and self-immoliate or you're full of, you know, you're burning, douse yourself with petrol and set yourself a light. There's no conversations you're having with anyone except screaming. Or maybe not, but you're not talking to people. Like, how's it? How are you? And we see in this, in this parable that this man is speaking. So we understand that this fire is not a literal fire, but it's, it's doing something that, that, that the rich man is very uncomfortable and he doesn't like it at all. Something is happening and he, that he can't, can't tolerate. And that is the eternal destiny of people outside of Jesus. Amen. So I want to encourage you. If you don't know the Lord and you don't know where your eternal destiny is, if you have to die of a heart attack today or run over a car, fall out of an airplane. You don't know where you'd be with forever. With Jesus or with Satan and his angels. If that's you, why don't you put your hand up and we'd love to pray for you. Just quickly put your hand up and we'll pray for you. Right where you're standing. There's one hand up. Jess, can I, Jess, can I ask you a favor? Can you, t can, would you mind going with Jess? There she's coming there now.
Thanks, Jess. That's wonderful. I just remember her from previously being here. So there is some history there. Amen. So, Father, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord, for the tree of life. We thank you, Spirit of God, that you are God who loves us and your desires for us to be with you. Your desires for us to eat continuously from that which brings life. We thank you that the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness, faithfulness and self-control. That is the fruit from that tree. We thank you, Lord, that is our portion. We thank you, Lord, that we are people who value eternal things. And we don't, like Esau, give up eternal destinies for a pot of stew. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with grace for this coming week, Lord. That we'd stand strong against any temptations the enemy tries to bring for, for quick gratification of stuff. That we'd look to you, look to your bride for strength. In Jesus' name, we thank you for this, Father. Amen.